If you're into numbers, check this out. In the 65 years since the subject of today's show was designed, more than 11,500 models of this Mach 2.0 capable fighter jet were built. At one time, it was proliferated to 60 countries on four continents, and incredibly, it is still in widespread use today in 2020. But numbers aside, how effective was it? What was it like to fly? And how did the pilots who flew it feel about this iconic fighter? Well, that's what we find out this week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, thanks to our guest, retired Indian Air Force Air Commodore, Suren Tiagi. I would say that I really love that aircraft and personally my very strong belief, which is a very sincere belief from the heart for every fighter pilot in the world, that they would love to fly MiG-21. I don't think that there is any aircraft which is a better aircraft to fly as a fighter pilot. Breaking out to the east now, one guy on the west. Oh, oh, I got him. I got him. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to episode 82 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. That's right, today we're exploring the legendary MiG-21 fish bed in all its glory. I am your host, Jello, and returning to the show this week to assist with co-host duties is the guest from episode 60 on the MiG-29 Fulcrum, retired Indian Air Force Air Marshal Harish Masan. Welcome back to the show, Harish. Uh, thank you, Vincent. And hi, everybody. Good to be back on the show. Oh, it's great to have you back. And let's see, it's been 22 episodes since we heard from you last. What's new in your world? I guess things have changed just a little bit, haven't they? Well, like everywhere else in the world, you know, we've been on a lockdown since late March. And in India, there's been a nationwide lockdown. So we're getting used to working from home, like, and socializing only with your spouse, of course. Mm -hmm. And of course, the air and water bodies have become cleaner. The stars are brighter at night when I see them. You know, they always were here in my place. But I think nature is telling us that it can heal itself just like our bodies, provided we let it. Well, and there is always a silver lining to something. So hopefully, this whole ordeal can have its good side as well. That's a very good point you make. Now, I didn't realize when I recorded the interview with today's guest that you and Surin turn out to be friends from quite a ways back, huh? Oh, yeah. I've known Surin <laughs> or Bundle. I, I always call it Bundle, you know. And, yeah, Bundle. And his family for over 35 years now, 1975, <laughs> we go back then. We flew together in the MiG-21 when I joined his squadron. As luck would have it, uh, when I was commanding the MiG-29 squadron and Bundle came and converted uh, on the MiG-29s with me. Oh. Uh, Bundle is a very keen fighter pilot, I must tell you. Oh, gosh. And he has the most hours on the MiG-21, at least in India, yeah. as far as I know, and maybe in the world, I don't know. <laughs> and I think he's certainly the best person to talk about the MiG-21. I'm personally looking forward to it. Oh, me too. And I just am remembering recording it with him and it was just laughs because he's just always in such a good mood. So we'll get to the interview in just a few moments. But as everyone knows here on the show, we'll have just a few announcements first and some listener questions. Now, as most of you likely already know, a Canadian Forces Snowbird jet went down on May 17th, 2020, just days after our feature episode about the team. And naturally, our condolences go out to the entire Snowbirds team and the family of Captain Jen Casey, the public affairs officer who perished in the mishap. The guest on that show, Scratch, he returned the day after the mishap to offer some analysis of what we see in the footage taken that day from some folks next to the airfield. And if you are interested in that, take a look at our YouTube channel. Harish, did you have a chance to see the different footage of the crash from that day? And did you have any thoughts on what we see? Yeah, sadly I did. And I even saw the press conference of the commander Mike French, I think was the name. Okay. And being a display pilot myself, having been one, you know, I feel bad when anyone is lost in such shows. I guess it's too, too early to conjecture on the cause, but I guess the Canadians will let us know all the time. Yeah. My condolences too to the family. Right. 
In the video, I will confess, I felt a little dirty, shall I say, because that's basically what Scratch and I did is we tried not to assign any blame, but we frankly were speculating on what we thought it could be, but we tried to make it in as educational a video as possible. For example, we talked about the fact that they did a section takeoff, as we would call it, and then suddenly you see the wingman pitch up. And so we talk about the escape maneuvers and the reasons why you might do that. So anyway, like you said, we won't know until the investigation is released. And by then, sometimes it's months later and people have forgotten, but those of us in the industry, hopefully we can circle back and find out what happened. I agree. In happier news, this past week, we republished an article from episode 13 and 14 guest, Commander Jack Price, about night catapult launches. Now, Farva, as he goes by, he's currently deployed in command of a growler squadron, and he experiences these challenging evolutions almost nightly. Head over to the fighterpilotpodcast.com and check out the musings tab where we have our blogs. Some of them are mine and others are from guests. And finally, if you caught the bonus episode we released this past Past week, you heard us promote the excellent book, Harnessing the Sky, chronicling the life and adventures of aviation pioneer Frederick Trapnell during the tumultuous periods leading up to and following World War II in the Pacific. And congratulations go out to Brian Messina, Chris Franklin, and one other winner who we don't want to name yet without his permission, but he's been notified. Each won a copy of Harnessing the Sky, autographed by the two authors, Trap's son, Fred Jr., and granddaughter, Dana. If you enjoy naval aviation history but didn't win this time, don't despair. You can still visit our website, go to the shop page, and then to the literature section to pick up your very own copy of this highly enjoyable book through Amazon. Well, that's it for announcements for this week. Harish, I have a couple of listener questions to tackle. Are you willing to help? Sure thing. I'm in. Okay, great. Why don't we start with a phone call? What's up, Jello? This is Jet from Dallas, Texas. I just wanted to ask, why do the Sequoias, or the Sequoias, however you say them, why do they have that long uh, thing that comes out that splits the two engines in the back? I got to imagine it's for balance or something, but I always thought it just looks so goofy. What's your take on it? Thank you. See you later. Okay, Harish, Jet is asking about the stinger between the tail, let's say there, of the SU-27. And what do we got on there? Maybe a rear-facing radar or what? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Well, as you know, the, the flanker is a big plane and a very heavy plane and close to about mm -hmm. 30, 30 tons plus. So it has a, a very large tail shoot and two of them. They had to be out somewhere. So I think the Russian just put a housing or a, or a fairing there, big housing, which sticks out. I don't think it has anything else because it opens up and the shoots come out. It doesn't have a radome or anything behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, just a housing for the big parachutes of the flanker. Okay. Now, on top of the body of the shank there, if you will, are some expendable ports, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. That's for countermeasure systems, right? Okay. Great. Hey, next is an email from Keter Carmarker who asks, how do you view the future of air combat to be? Ultra BVR, meaning long range is I think what he's asking, with hypersonic missiles or WVR, i.e. within visual range. As I remember, Keter continues, both the MiG-29 in Serbia down by an Eagle and another by a Hornet in the 1991 Gulf War, the missiles were pretty much launched inside the 10 mile range. And I think here, Harishi means maybe the MiG-21s in the uh, Gulf War. But what are your thoughts? I mean, we have stealth, which is a system. We have these long range weapons. We have radar advancements. And yet, even like the Sukhoi shot down uh, over Syria not long ago, everything seems to be pretty close range. Well, Winston, this is, this is a very interesting question and a very complex one, too. Mm. And I guess it's bothering most people, most folks in military aviation today. A question like this actually requires a long answer, but, but I'll try and answer it briefly considering the time constraints in this program. I personally believe that the BBR is just another kind of weapon which uh, raises the stakes in an engagement. Mm. If BBRs were actually the ultimate answer, you won't need super agility in our platforms and fighters, which comes at a cost. You know? Right. Also, why carry a gun in that case? You know, it's a dead weight. Against an equal adversary, anything that depends on electronics, sensors and homing systems included, can be countered sometime or the other by somebody. So by depending solely on BVR missiles, 
we would probably be committing a similar mistake of removing the gun from fighters like we did in the Vietnam War. But let me take you a little further, like you mentioned, stealth. So what if both sides have stealth? They would probably merge before they even detect each other. <laughs> Therefore, I think for the foreseeable future, I don't see the visual bubble going anywhere. Well, that seems to jive with what our guest co-host Chip said on the F-35 episode we had a couple shows ago, because you just never know. Like you said, there could be the fog of war, there could be electronic attack, there could be equal capability, which could result in that essentially fist fight between soldiers. So uh, that is probably the foreseeable future. But to your point, we still need the capability to reach out beyond visual range, but we need that visibility within visual range capability. Ability, I'm trying to say as well. So absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Finally, let's finish with another phone call. G'day, Jello. It's Alex from South Australia, so I'll make this brief. On the uh, AC130 episode, uh, I was just wondering, are there any considerations for operating from unprepared strips or, say, dirt strips, or is there a worry about, uh, say, foreign object debris in the weapon system? So, are they able to? Un- operate from prepared strips or sorry unprepared strips or dirt strips or only paper and rice cheers harish i can take this one uh, alex i put your question to our recent ac-130 guest buck and he responded that many c-130 variants do operate from unprepared strips but gunships don't for several reasons, and these are his words. He says, first, the aircraft is very heavy and most takeoffs are close to maximum takeoff weight allowed. For combat operations, they often receive waivers to exceed the maximum weight by as much as 10,000, sometimes 20,000 pounds at takeoff. This requires a much longer runway and would make taxiing on softer surfaces a very difficult proposition. Secondly, with aerial refueling, the gunships can travel greater distances, so they use that capability to provide coverage from more traditional runways. Finally, Buck says, Alex mentioned the potential of fouling the weapons with foreign object debris. While not a concern on traditional runways, uh, it is possible for takeoff and landing that the elevation of the guns is typically raised to a more horizontal position and the 105 millimeter can be partially retracted inside the aircraft. So Alex, I hope that satisfies. And again, thank you, Buck, for helping that because I would not have known all that. And Harish, hopefully you learned something as well. Yeah, you're bad. Yeah. A 105 is a big one, you know, inside the gunship. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, that will do it for listener questions for this week. Why don't we get to our featured interview on the MiG-21 with Bundle? And Harish, before we listen to it, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, Looking forward to it. And uh, We have just one paradox of history uh, that the aviation buffs in this program may want to look up in detail on their own later, if they're interested. I just mentioned it in brief, you know. It's pretty ironical that the Indian Air Force, and to a large extent even the political and the bureaucratic establishment in the 1960s, was actually very keen on the 104 Starfighter. Mm. Unfortunately, the U.S. didn't want to give the 104 to India. They had given 12 to Pakistan. Uh and actually suggested the F-5 Freedom Fighter or the English Electric Lightning. And we ended up uh, with the MiG-21 finally as the first Soviet combat aircraft in our inventory. Uh, no looking back after that because you know, a lot of, lot of aircraft came from there after that, both due to geopolitical and, I guess, economic factors. Yeah. Well, let's learn all about it. Now, before we do, if you are metrically challenged like I am, then for starters, you can, for a rough approximation, double kilograms to get pounds and triple meters to get feet. And again, that's not exact. You would need to add another 10% to really be precise. Uh, There might be another couple conversions you need, like roughly eight kilometers is five miles, but those are statute miles, not nautical miles. Anyway, good luck with all that if you're from America like I am and you only know our system. Without further ado, let's get to Surin and the MiG-21 fish bed. Today, dialing in to the Fighter Pilot Podcast all the way from the west coast of India is former Air Commodore of the Indian Air Force, Surin Tiagi, call sign Bundal. Surin, did I get that correct? Yes, quite correct. <laughs> in American accent, it's correct. 
Oh, uh, yes. Well, I realize I have a strong accent uh, by your standards. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, sir, for taking the time to come on the show today. It's a pleasure always. Great. Well, we're glad to have you, and I can't wait to learn all about your amazing experiences and today's aircraft, the MiG-21 Fishbed. But let's start with you, sir. Where are you from in India? What was your experiences like in the Indian Air Force as far as different jobs maybe you had? And what do you do now? Well, I was born in the North Indian uh, city of Meerut. Of course, after I joined the Air Force, then I was posted into 28 different places in 34 years of service. So this was being part of the whole country. And uh, last posting was in uh, Jamnagar in Gujarat. I retired and settled down in West India, Jamnagar in Gujarat. Of course, uh, as far as the Air Forces go, I joined in 1963 as cadet. My first sortie in the Indian Air Force aircraft I did was in uh, November 1963. And of course, last was December 1996. Wow. So <laughs> I was fortunate to continue flying till last day of my, or nearly last day of my service. Wow. And uh, 34 years. That's amazing. Uh, during the Air Force, I, of course, uh, graduated from the fighter combat school as a fighter combat leader. I was an Air Force examiner. I was also Air Force inspector for operational uh, assessment of every unit of the Indian Air Force. I graduated from uh, Military College of Combat, which is a joint service uh, course. It is a high course, which is considered as a postgraduate course. So we call it MPhil. And that was in Mao in central India. Okay. So, of course, during the service, I was, uh, I mean, posted various places, which probably I'll tell you a little later. But this is how the services were my bringing up. Okay. Well, it sounds like you have similar time frame and experiences as one of our former guests on the show, Air Marshal Hassan. I have to think you must know each other. Uh, yes, of course. We know each other very well. <laughs> In fact, when he came to MiG-21s, he came to the squadron. I was the senior pilot. I was the combat leader trainer. So his all initial training on MiG-21 in flying uh, combat missions was, I was very responsible, frankly. <laughs> I see. And as I understand, is it the MiG-21 that you mostly flew through your career? Yes, I flew MiG-21 from 1968 to 1996, so 28, year, 28 and a half years nearly. I flew many other fighter aircraft of Indian Air Force that is starting from Vampire, then Hunters. Then I graduated to MiG-21. MiG-21 stayed as the main aircraft all the while. Whilst, of course, I flew NAT, a British uh, aircraft built in India, very small, 65, it did wonders. Okay. Then as modified by Indian, it was Ajit, the second model which I flew. Thereafter, of course, MiG-23, MiG-29s, Jaguars, Mirage 2000, HF-24. I commanded a squadron which was combined squadron of Canberra and MiG-29, uh, 23s, uh, 21s. So I was able to command two fighter squadrons wow. and I was base commander of two fighter air bases. That's a, All right. a great career. I really pride how God was kind and the Air Force was really cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. How many hours then did you end up with? And I realize you don't get hour at a time in the MiG-21 with the right. shorter flights, but how many flight hours did you end up with in the MiG-21? In MiG-21, I landed up with 4,000 and... Three hours, 45 minutes to be ex exact. <laughs> <laughs> and I did uh, over 6,316 uh, uh, sorties on that. That was on MiG-21. Wow. Of course, total flying with all the other aircraft, which I flew 50, 60, 70 sort of uh, uh, sorties. So I have got about 4,900 all uh, flying in, in my career. <laughs> <laughs> You're an aviation legend, Surin. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a very, uh, I must say that a uh, very ordinary fighter pilot of Indian Air Force. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, okay, so over 6,000 hours in different types of flying. Let's see if I can be gentle the way that I ask this. Do the number of takeoffs equal the number of landings, or did you ever have to try the ejection seat in any of those flights? Well, you can call, there was uh, all the takeoffs were landed, 
in one case i landed with the undercarriage up and the aircraft it was a crash landing mainly because my engine failed out <laughs> so but landing and take off are landing. The, uh, the same number <laughs> that's amazing for that number of flight hours mm. because especially with a single engine aircraft that really says something for the aircraft and of course for the pilot well i would say that i really love that aircraft and personally my very strong belief which is a very sincere belief from the heart for every fighter pilot in the world that they would love to fly mig 21 oh yes i don't think that there is any aircraft which is a better aircraft to fly as a fighter pilot well let's dig right into it now on this show we have had an episode on the exploitation of the MiG-21 that the United States did back in the early 80s but we didn't talk too much about the actual aircraft or the flying we talked mostly about the program so with your help today sir I'd like to really get into the aircraft itself and what it was like to fly it and fight it and let's just begin with what it was designed to do from the beginning i mean it followed up right the MiG-15 17 and 19 but it was different from those and it had i believe a different role did it not indeed entirely different basically when the russian designed it it first flew in 1956 and yuri gagarin was the test pilot that time it came into russian service in 1960 and we got in india in 1963 so initial version were it was meant for dash interceptions uh, it had a, a reasonable good acceleration it used to just climb up and the, all our initial training we used to do in the yuri gagarin suit as we used to call it is the space suit what he actually finally flew out in the space when he went wow. and uh, there the everything was restricted you just sat in an open throttle and carried on straight and climbed up to 22 kilometers and uh, speed of 2.1 or 2.2 mark and i uh, very happy with that and uh, you of course never had a chance to engage with anyone and really intercept except for the friendly aircraft and doing practice interceptions <laughs> okay that's how it was designed but then uh, later on when it came to india and we came as a only a pure uh, interceptor by 1966 or 67 when we started getting larger number of aircraft initially we had got only six and of that unfortunately two were uh, destroyed on ground in 1965 war so we had very little uh, okay. but thereafter when they started coming in and uh, to a level that at one time nearly 65 to 70% of the air force was equipped with only big 21s it was really very large number so that's the time we modi- uh, we started changing the aircraft configuration to also be ground attack it could carry the rp pods even earlier gun it couldn't either it could carry the ventral tank or the podded gun but later on it had a built in gun which the subsequent uh, aircraft which came like we call them type 21 mf and uh, ms which were built by the hal in under license they had the built in gun so thereafter of course all the mig 21s had built in gun yes with twin barrel gasha gun 23 mm good rate of fire okay we'll get to the weapons in just a minute was there a particular role in the Indian Air Force at least that the MiG-21 was very well suited for did you prefer it for the air to ground or did it become good at air to air or dog fighting or what was a common role that the MiG-21 excelled at to my mind it was good in both the roles okay it did well in air combat because a highly maneuverable aircraft it has a very large envelope of flying it can continue flying at 280 kilometers and it can go up to 2400 kilometers i mean if you violate the limitation written in the book it does that very easily of course air to ground if i may just share with you a small thing about in our air force we have this probably in america must be us also must be having these inter squadron fighter gunnery meets where all the fighter squadrons participate in a gunnery meet and they decide which is the best fighter aircraft in particular role and of the eight events which are mostly mostly on air to ground role mig 21 used to win at least 5 to 6 out of 8 which is against jaguars and including mirage 2000 so you can imagine oh wow uh, my personal considered belief is that anywhere where the pilot himself is responsible you are not taking assistance from the systems which are giving you the pilot performance probably is the ultimate ah. he can really and i must share with you if you won't laugh then i'll tell you that what we had in the earlier version of big 21 were only three main instrument you had 
ASI, you had the basically ASI artificial horizon right. and RPM gauge so that you know when a G meter was put in one side to know that how much G once in a while that you pulled. We had no angle of attack indicator or nothing to tell you that. So everything was by seat of pen. Wow. And we had the gun sight which was a fixed gun sight. It was like putting a chewing gum on the windscreen <laughs> and put it there and fire. Every assessment of your distance, your range to open fire had to be done manually. And we used to win, Wow! you can imagine, four to five. So I would say that it was good in ground attack role. And uh, okay. to say briefly, probably I thought that I will discuss this later when you ask me later on, on uh, something special, then I thought I'll mention that. <laughs> but it was very good even in combat role we did with earlier aircraft hunters, Nats, which were very, very good and very versatile. But it could get better of them. Well, it really required the pilot to be good at piloting. I mean, that's a rhetorical thing to say, but in other words, aircraft these days can make up for errors because of the automation. But in a MiG-21, it really came down to the person in the ejection seat. Absolutely. You're you absolutely right. Okay. That's what one thing I think you and I as a fighter pilot pride, that we ourselves, we feel that we are the ultimate in terms of performance. I mean, at least that's what our belief is. <laughs> we may be wrong. Most times, maybe we are. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I think for people who uh, are not fighter pilots, but maybe have driven older cars where you don't have the anti-lock brakes or the steering protection or different things, you can make a car do more than you can with the cars these days that have the automatic slowing down brakes and bumpers, and, or I shouldn't say bumpers, but the beepers around you in case you get too close. So it really makes up for, again, a driver in that case who yeah. isn't as good. All right. So, Saren, the next question we could spend hours on, um, and that's the variants. So let's just agree that there are hundreds of variants of the MiG-21. And of course, you have the original nomenclature from the Soviet Union at the time with the suffixes. So it would be MiG-21S or MiG-21SMT and all those. But then you also had the NATO name. So fishbed A, B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. Right. Then you had some bison. I think you had some lancer. There were some other words. Uh, suffice to say, there are a lot of variants. Let's just ask you, which variants did you fly? And was there a particular one, if there was more than one, that you liked the best? I have flown all the MiG-21 variants which came to India. Okay. And then I was on deputation to Iraq to train their pilots on fully operational role itself for nearly two years. Oh, wow. Then we flew some of the PMUs, which was slightly different. But uh, only aircraft of MiG family I have not flown actually is only Bison because it came after uh, four years after my retirement. So I was there only to <laughs> see it inducted into the Indian Air Force, but really not fly. I see. But I've flown all of them. If you ask me that which one I would have preferred, well, it's like this, that on MiG-21, the initial one, which was uh, FL, we called, which we participated in the 1971 war with, we did all the ground attack with that bombing and rocketry and uh, mainly bombing rocketry. I mean, you can imagine a bomb in a 45 degrees dive on a fixed site with no other aid, totally from your feel of your pants. My... Average for the year was 11 yards. <laughs> oh. I mean, of course. <laughs> That's really, really good. Now, what kind of bomb was that? Was that a practice kg bomb, bomb? Like a light? These are the actual 500 kg bomb. Oh, gosh. Wow. So, well, if you hit within 11 yards with a 500-pound bomb that has explosives in it, it'll do just fine. <laughs> 15 yards, we used to call direct hit up to 15 meters. Yeah. It was good enough. And that's why if you will recollect in that war, the results, the Dhaka runways, when we bombed them, the first day itself. Thereafter, they poor uh, people. I mean, I really feel bad for a pilot, uh, whether this side or that side. If you couldn't fly and you could see the enemy aircraft crossing over you all the time. <laughs> well, Saran, I must tell you that when I was in flight school in the U.S., we flew the TA-4J Skyhawk. Right. And it was a, a pleasure to fly, but we also did manual bombing. And I was awful. I couldn't get the bomb anywhere in the state of Mississippi. <laughs> so <laughs> I have newfound oh, respect so, for so. you to uh, get it consistently within 11 yards because I think I finally had one flight where they routinely were maybe within 100 feet, uh, maybe 200 feet if I was lucky. But before that, because you have to get the aircraft not only to the right point of the sky, but at the right angle, at the right speed, at the right heading, and then a little bit of windage. So, But 11 yards, when I say, 
it was the total average for the year. I mean, we uh, probably dropped about uh, okay. uh, 18 bombs. So average of the 18 bombs. That's why when 1917 one war, when we had to go for any of these bombing, they said, oh, his bombing is very good. So <laughs> I used to fortunate to get those more missions on <laughs> bombing there. Then other than that, then the site improved. Okay. We got uh, gyro site in uh, mm. MiG-21 M, MFs and uh, Bays and Bisons, of course, is entirely different aircraft in terms of uh, sighting and uh, which we probably can discuss separately. We will discuss separately in uh, Bison in itself. Yeah. But these other aircraft, they were very stable platform for uh, air to ground firing. Uh, gyro site did help you much, much uh, more than the earlier site. And that's why probably I would say that our results became very consistent. I remember in one of the thing that you fire uh, 20 rockets, 57 millimeter and all direct hit. I mean, I'm talking in four each time. So that means five different missions you go and you get direct hit, mainly because the gun sight was very, very, very stable and very nice. So there <laughs> great help that the site started giving you. Gotcha. And uh, we did uh, use it uh, very, very well. Oh, wow. So that, those were the aircraft which, uh, of course, they had... The power ratio, to my mind, was reasonably good to do any kind of role that you wanted. It could really accelerate well. Okay. The MiG-21s that India originally got, do the MiG-21s that are in the Indian Air Force today look the same as far as, again, we're talking variants now. So is it still a relatively basic cockpit or have they been upgraded with the displays or new systems or anything? There's been changes in every model which uh, came. Okay. Initial one, the first one which came in 1963 had the pito head and the below the aircraft nose. Then, of course, it came to on top of the aircraft and then it stayed there. Then it came to the side. So, the modification only on that nose, of course, itself. Because this is the only aircraft I must share with you in the world which has flown as a fighter aircraft which has a variable cone. Ah, yes. There is no other aircraft which has a variable cone. And the cone, with the, depend upon the speed right. and your density and the temperatures, it moves to give you the optimal uh, airflow before the turbine. Right. And very sensitive. Of course, it also adds to uh, additional emergency, which normally would, you wouldn't have. So in this case, because if it malfunctions, then you have a little problem. Uh -huh. But that's an excellent feature that is there, and it really controls the airflow very, very well. And did the cone in the nose move forward and aft um, by pilot input or by automatically with the speed? No, by picking up of the P1 and P4 pressure, which is at the lip and the in, in the rear somewhere, it's automatic. It does it itself. Okay. So the aircraft started changing. The cockpit initially used to open forward upwards. Then it started opening sideways right. with a change model. And now, of course, with the Bisons are uh, single uh, front cockpit, one plate a cockpit and a bubble. Uh, so it's changed completely. Right. Inside, of course, also it's changed because earlier we didn't have any avionics of kind with system operated. So they basically instrument you had in underneath inside, you saw your instrument, the ASI, VSI, TSI and or artificial horizon. Gotcha. And now, of course, the system is giving with how do you see everything and miniature that is put inside. So the cockpit layout has considerably changed. From outside, you can uh, not really make out much okay. uh, the shape. If you see it from flying in the air, probably, then you may not be able to find the difference. Right. And the great advantage that it has is the delta wing of only 23 feet, I mean 7.15 meter. So it's so sleek. That's the advantage it uses against air combat with any other aircraft because it gets picked up so late. Right. And there is no radar signature, which is of any kind of, uh, it's a very, very small uh, radar signature that it gives. Okay. There's some new aircraft upgrades being offered in different countries. At least there were several years ago, Romania, Israel, maybe South Africa, I don't recall, but where they were putting some of the newest weapons on the MiG-21. And like you were saying, some of the more displays and better avionics and so nowadays you have the aircraft that's been around almost what 60 over 60 years but it is still very capable oh yes the fact is that the, what we have got now was improving very well and i'm sure you must be aware that the f-16 actually in the 70s was designed to counter mig-21 base and uh, base performance just to share a very brief thing with the emergency afterburner which is the second afterburner i have done a takeoff Wheels roll to 40,000 feet in 2 minutes, 45 seconds. Wow. 
So it's a very good aircraft and it turns reasonably well. And of course, I don't expect that today the air combat will be of the olden days that you're carrying on in a 360 day turns repeatedly. It'll be very small. So you can initial turn, you can match. Of course, you can't sustain those turns. Right. But uh, thereafter, where the pilot's uh, skill probably will come and the situational difference will arise. So that was even up to base is an excellent aircraft. Now came Bison. Now, Bison is a aircraft which is really as modern and as upgraded as any other aircraft in the flying today for the kind of aircraft, but for the airframe and engine, which is old, which they modified to put the systems in. But it has all the, I mean, multi-role radar, which is come, look down, look up, mm-hmm. Copio, which uh, uh, Russians uh, were flying in there, make the 93 variant, which we said, you know, that's not good. We want to do our own modification. So that's one thing which look down, shoot down, tracking of eight t- targets at a time, engage two. So which is a very uh, plus uh, that you get. And with the kind of missile you carry, you don't really expect to engage more than two targets <laughs> anyways, because uh, yeah. you carry only so True. many missiles. Yeah. So then, of course, the ground mapping, etc., all came in. So everything earlier we used to mark with a pencil on the map, hold the map against the canopy. And thereafter, just look at this and look at the ground and say, oh, I have drifted 500 meters, let me correct. And you are flying, you are looking for your number two and number three and number four. Mm -hmm. You are also looking for the enemy to attack you. So it was a great demand on the pilot. And that's what uh, I must say that for us, when we used to do the earlier versions of MiG-21, when we sat in the cockpit, I have actually claimed that we were doing meditation. So I don't have to go for yoga classes because (laughs) actually you got into cockpit and the demand on you for completing your mission was so much that you couldn't think of anything else in the world. I mean, only thing which you were thinking (laughs) of your and uh, just being with that. Of course, this all with the bison now has everything that you would. Its armament is excellent. It has uh, R-373 close combat. It has R-77 BVR. Mm-hmm. It has CAV 500 TV guided missile, I mean a uh, bomb. Then uh, it has 80 millimeter S8, 80 millimeter rockets. So it has uh, got everything which you will find that, and it can also carry all the earlier uh, uh, armament, which like say rocket pods and the right. S24, which is a, it's a rocket bomb. In fact, it's a 250 kg okay. and uh, very accurate. So that uh, is what it also carries that. So it has... Uh, uh, really uh, now come up to modern aircraft. And uh, okay. Vincent, if I must share, I mean, it's a normal pilot from a poor country where we can't really afford much, that it actually has held itself when any of the exercises were carried out between the USAF or French Air Force or, you know, uh, British RAF coming to India and we did. The aircraft, only aircraft which probably was appreciated was uh, the bison. Okay. And mainly because it got picked up very late and it had all the necessity wherewithal to give a good fight to anybody that it saw. <laughs> I see. Great. It also has helmet mountain sights. So, which is a, I mean, it's a very modern and the total uh, modification was just about 5.5 million. So, which is really, <laughs> which is really nothing. Huh? Very affordable. Okay. All right, so there are many different kinds of MiG-21s, and they're flown almost all around the world. What, something like 60 different countries? We've talked about India and uh, Iraq. You said you trained over there. And as well, China. I mean, golly, where hasn't this flown, right? <laughs> Very large number of countries. In fact, the total production is more than 11,600, were produced. That is only not counting the Chinese. Wow. So, huh, the so uh, their mm-hmm. uh, aircraft, not counting that, they have been really produced nearly 11,500. Uh, we ourselves in India produce nearly 700 aircraft. And they are still in operational service today? Yes, we have now, we still have many squadrons of that. Probably till the time the replacement of uh, Rafael comes in, uh, they will probably stay. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, the Bison basically also that autopilots have improved, it, uh, it can stabilize. The surge, anti-surge things have been incorporated because the missile firing used to give mm-hmm. problem with the engine. We've had a, a incident where during 71 war in the night, missile was fired 
and the engine flamed out. And you can imagine if it flames out in, in the enemy territory, fortunately it relit and uh, the aircraft came back. So it's like that. So now Bison certainly is an excellent uh, flying uh, machine. Huh? Hmm. Right. And it has, as far as looks go, a very distinctive shape, I would say. Right. Like you said, the shot cone in the nose, it's very small relatively to some aircraft. And it's got the delta-shaped wings and the single tail, single engine, single pilot, except for the trainers. But it's, I think, very distinctive shape. There's no confusing it, I don't think, with other aircraft too much. No, not at all. It's a very distinctive shape. I suppose because they had made it uh, at that point in time when they were coming in like Starfighter 104 of ours F, mm -hmm. they all were supersonic concept was to make very thin wings and very aerodynamic small uh, structure. So I suppose it is from that generation. But they have carried on and uh, it's now held till now. It looks very beautiful. It looks very impressive. Yes. And just to share with you, when you do rolls on that, it looks good. When you do, say, a stall turn on MiG-21, because it has a very long uh, nose, it feels so good when you see your delta wing cutting the horizon and then thereafter nose cutting the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> Great to fly. So it's a, a beautiful shape. And mainly because uh, long nose, uh, mainly because of the cone, which was in incorporated. And the radar is also housed there. It's clear that regardless of how long it's been or how many hours you have flying total, or in the MiG-21 for that matter, Seren, you still have a love for this airplane, huh? Actually, I flew MiG-29s, <laughs> and thereafter I lost interest because it was a, such a single roll aircraft. Pulling 6G, well, how much can you pull uh, 9Gs? How much 9Gs can you pull? I mean, you can only enjoy that for so much. Here you have so much uh, more demand on you, so much more variation in your role that you can uh, participate in. Yes. So I found that uh, its multi-role uh, name actually is uh, really uh, suits it. <laughs> All right. Well, next up on my list is the armament. Now, we've already talked about it. So multiple different air-to-air -air missiles, including infrared and radar and even the active, I forget if what you call it, but we would call it the AA-12 Adder has been added to the later variants. And then you talked about air-to-ground bombs and rockets. It carries just about everything, huh? And with the new missile system yeah. coming in, I mean, all missiles come on board. It's good. And as we say that today, when somebody says, compare the performance of two fighters, I find it such a superficial official uh, concept because we are firing BVRs. You don't even see who you fired at. Your system is telling you on the signature that this is so-and-so type and you can launch or not launch. Right. In fact, it's launching on its own. You just press the trigger and keep it pressed till the time it goes. So unlike in our time when we were growing, it was a air combat when you, it was always visual contact and you had to fire guns and you had to come down to 300 meters. So that's where the maneuvering actually was important. Yeah. That how well you, the aircraft can perform, how well you can maneuver the aircraft, how well you can really exploit the envelope of, uh, flying envelope of that particular machine that you're flying in. Now I think it's uh, lost most of uh, that uh, part of it. Well, it, the, the warfare has changed, just like it did through the Middle Ages when you had archers and knights and different types of battle in hand-to-hand -hand or at range. So, yes, warfare will continue to change, I would think, Seren. Now, as far as performance goes, let's start with the flying of it. Did you find it easy to fly? Or we've already talked about it does its best with a proficient pilot, but did you find the actual flying to be somewhat easy or was it a challenge but once you got good at it then you could do it very well almost like a musical instrument maybe uh, tell you frankly that if initial version which was type 77 as we called it which was a very good aircraft to handle because there was a direct transmission between the joystick and the stabilizer and so you it responded very well of course later on they for certain indications and monitoring system they placed certain micro switches in the stick column so that there was always a little gap between the two and it was lighter, mm. much lighter aircraft comparatively. So it used to maneuver very, very well, but it had nothing else. We didn't have anything on that. Uh. So whilst it was like a sports car to drive, but difficult to handle because your rate of approach, your rate of descent or when you're approaching, approaching angle used to be nearly five and a half degrees. So it is quite steep because you couldn't see with the long nose, you had to really keep it. And uh, it was uh, challenging to fly initially but uh, once you got used to once you got the feel of it and you didn't really exceed 
the limitation your limitation aircraft exceeding aircraft limitation only happens when you try and exceed your own limitation that you really mishandle the aircraft right so when that aircraft went into any kind of sink that means hydraulic situation recovery was very very difficult it took a very large height up sometime up to 2 kilometers to recover so if you're doing anything uh, middle level say 3 kilometers 2 kilometers or low level then you didn't have a chance to that's why initially we had uh, lost some number of aircraft okay i suppose uh, but uh, once you got used to it you could fly it at uh, as i would say that up to 280 kilometers i mean you could handle the aircraft as long as you control the What was the fastest you ever had one or the highest? If you won't tell anyone then I can tell you. <laughs> 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 well, I we used to do a profile very regularly which was our initial type. This obviously could happen only on type 77, the first ones. Because later on there were limitation on ceiling etc. Okay. There was a profile which 16 kilometers you accelerated to 1.85 and thereafter raise your nose and you had to climb to 22 kilometers. actually you were supposed to level out at 21 and uh, the speed of 2.2 mark i mean they used to say that stop at 2.1 but then light and uh, the atmosphere is so wow. so when we did mostly we used to exceed that you know go to 23 22 i had heard that a russian test pilot once in 1960 had held the record the height record of 34 kilometers so i said yeah let's try i mean can it how where can it go of course those were different aircraft i didn't really i was young so really didn't get into very professional aspect of much yeah so i did attempt i crossed the 24 the engine flamed out but the speed was about 2.4 mac so it was not slowing down there was no drag at all of any kind wow and now i had the stick i wanted to put my nose down and i was finding it unable so i probably touched 27 kilometers when slowly the nose started dropping finally of course i was only hoping that it will relight at the height that it had to come down to 10 kilometers in pure uh, glide and it did relight so and those days we didn't have well, a recording system yeah. so fortunately <laughs> so nobody knew about it till now <laughs> Well, that's crazy. Golly. Yeah, well, so I already knew the end of the story because you told me that the number of takeoffs and landings were the same. So I assumed that once you got into that thicker air, the engine relit. But that must have been pretty harrowing for a little while. The cockpit was so silent. At that height, uh, the controls were not responding because there was nothing to really, uh, no air surface, no air pressure. Oh. Till the time it uh, dropped itself and <laughs> came down to a reasonable height. Yes, yes, I was you, doing that you are only. <laughs> a hero, sir. <laughs> I was praying to God. <laughs> Jeez. Well, what about what was the most G's you ever pulled? G forces. Uh, G, I mean, sometime when uh, when you were particularly when suppose like I'm in mean, highest, probably I must have pulled when I was uh, doing air combat with the uh, MiG-29. I, I touched nine. I haven't gone beyond that. Nine. Nine G. Yes. basically on that aircraft you could at certain fuel only go up to 8 otherwise 7 7.5 was the limit so we used to maintain that much g only initially so uh, touch 8 and there up okay how about strengths and weaknesses of the aircraft now it's an older aircraft and even though it's been upgraded there are certainly a lot of things we've talked about so far that you found to be strengths but even an upgraded Make 21 Bison or it's still going to have that same airframe and as i understand one of the limitations was maybe the visibility from the cockpit visibility is one factor which is uh, still uh, uh, a handicap mm. particularly looking down okay uh, up in uh, horizontal is no problem at all but when do uh, we in our case we used to do a uh, very large number of low level missions though earlier days mainly to avoid the radar detection by the enemy so most time we were flying at 90 meters Now flying at that, your blind zone was very high. Mm. Of course, when you descend a little more, okay. at 50 meter, then you could see hell of a lot, because then the <laughs> so because <laughs> everything is above you at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so that was one of the major handicap. Another thing which I must mention that this aircraft was uh, actually, if uh, once we started, uh, you got uh, enough confidence and you had developed reasonably decent skill. you could make a very short landing on that i uh, remember that uh, normally i used to out of sheer uh, doing a musty that uh, and demonstrating on trainer i used to train all the younger pilots so that they should have a confidence that if their runway is blocked they should and they can't divert that they should not panic 
So 500 was very easily that you could stop that aircraft. 500 meters? Very short. So it's very was, short. But of course, you had to have a, a different perception of approach. You approach under shoot. When you came over the runway, you had to remember your judgment of that it takes 1.5 to 7 seconds for tail shoot to come out. So you deploy tail shoot and when tail shoot is just deploying, you're touching down. So everything works out like that. And I'll tell you an incident later that trying in this very fine performance, how I, I mean, fortunately got away and of course did one of the shortest landing of my life of 300 meters stopping the aircraft. <laughs> and that was with the okay. person, if you will remember, the school leader Sharma, Rakesh Sharma, who went uh, into the space the first time from India. He was a test pilot okay. in uh, Nasik. Uh, so he said, and my reputation had grown in the Air Force, the short landing, short, uh, slow speed loop I used to do. We could do loop on MiG-21, starting speed at 400 kilometers. So you can imagine. Wow. It was really a very, very, I mean, you could really handle that aircraft well. So he said, I said, okay. So we were doing a air test on trainer. I said, fine. Yeah. So for that, you had to bring the fuel really low so that your weight was less, so momentum reduced. So we were at no going around situation. So we came down and unfortunately that day I did everything right, but we got into ground effect when I rounded off at about a meter. Ah. So aircraft won't touch down. So I had to, we had BLC in that, that uh, second part. So we just pulled the throttle back and it immediately sinks. So we did, but the tail shoot had already come out. When we finally put the brake on 300 marker was there <laughs> that you have come 300 meters. <laughs> of course, the flying controller is wondering where the aircraft is gone because they couldn't see you roll on the runway. Uh, we jettisoned the shoot and we came back. So he asked me, sir, this you have to do once again. Make it like hell, not in my life. <laughs> once you can get away, but you can't get away a second time. Oh, dear. All right. Well, another, I think, strength of the aircraft, at least when you compare it to its nemesis in the Vietnam conflict, the F-4 Phantom, which was very smoky. I don't think the MiG-21, the engines weren't too smoky, were they? Or, or were they? I'm not sure. But they don't smoke. That is one. The strength, I would also say that that uh, it has a very large envelope of uh, maneuvering. That's uh, which a great advantage it has. Mm. It's a very small uh, signature, which is even whether visual or on radar, you can hardly spot it. Uh, very, very dead. And visually hard to keep sight. Mm -hmm. It can use both horizontal and vertical uh, for maneuvering very comfortably. Maneuvering, yeah. uh, at a lower speed, you just have to put the wing down and it carries on and it rotates very, very beautifully. That's amazing. So it has a maneuvering uh, advantage. Second, and most of all, as when you say, it becomes so difficult to spot it till the time it's come very, very close. Yes. And as I said, that accelerate, it accelerates well. It has a reasonably good rate of climb. Those are strength which, uh, and Bison has added in terms of system. So those are become very, very pluses, many pluses. Right. But the more systems, the heavier it gets, usually. Maneuvering does get affected, and that gets catered by the system that you incorporate, I suppose. It's trade-offs, as we often say. But for the wing, you said it was a thin wing like the aircraft of the day, and you're right, the F-104, F-106. Did the wing have any extra devices to help it with its flight, like leading edge flaps, or did it have the standard ailerons and trailing edge flaps? Basically standard aileron. It used to have one small uh, structure, which used to just cater for wind in case of high angle off. Mm. So that uh, to give, that's about all, nothing, otherwise nothing. It had... Uh, it has another great advantage, which I must probably, I don't know of any other aircraft. It has the floating flaps. Floating flaps. That means with the speed, they used to sink themselves into the main structure. So many times in air combat, when you came into the lower speeds, at 400, they used to go up fully on their own. Oh, okay. Say when you're doing a slower speed maneuvering, you could put them out and you got additional lift. So you could surprise many aircraft which were very overconfident of their performance and the machine they were sitting in. <laughs> that was a, and then you lift them up completely. So it was a one additional thing feature which was quite as a pilot. I'm talking. I mean, not as a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for notoriety, I think the MiG-21 is possibly the most proliferated, widely known, commonly seen fighter ever, I would think, right? So many, like you said, over 11,000 made, That's right. something like over 60 countries either flew it at one point, and some of them still do. Very widely known among military aviation circles. That's right. It was all over. I think I don't think there are any other uh, fighter aircraft which has really gone to so many countries. And Okay. Well, you've already shared some stories with us, but when you look back at your 
over 4,000, three hours and 45 minutes <laughs> flying the uh, MiG-21. Is there a particular flight that really stands out in your mind? Well, there's such a large number. And uh, Vincent, to share with you, I was also one of those that every minute matter to me. So we used to always want to make best out of it. That means sure. you put in a lot of things, you put in a pair takeoff, you put in close formation, you spread out, you did your combat or you did attack, then you came back in close formation, did a nice tight peel off and in 45 seconds from a peeling off, you were touching down. So you did a nice curvy tight circuit and uh, just took off bank and rolled, rounded off and landed. All of them really, but something as a, as a pilot which uh, one would say, this of course I'm a story I'm going to share the, for the second time only. This is uh, during 71 war. I mean, of course, because it shows little immaturity on part, but as a fighter pilot, you can't really expect it <laughs> to be very mature. I mean, that's where our advantage is. Uh -huh. We perform better mainly because of that. The spirit is so different and high. It was second day of the war, and I was uh, leading. There was another number two who finally retired as vice chief Air, Air Force. Uh, he was my number two, and we had gone as uh, to do a combat air patrol over the IP point where the hunters were coming to strike Pakistani Bangla, then East Pakistan armament factory. So we were on RT silence, and then we made a contact. And of course, I was uh, part of the combined formation. The formation was uh, other two were from the other squadron. They were the lead pair. We were the number two pair. Then, of course, when the hunters set coast, my lead pair decided to return. I said, look, we have fuel. Let them complete the attack and return. Then it will be fairer that, you know, there's no point if you don't have fuel, you can come back. But there is no such panic. So I said, we've come here to protect them, not only to see that they set coast to attack, but also that they return from the attack. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I told my number two, I said, you spread out. And this was very close to Tejgaon and Kurmitola, which were the runway fighter runways at Dhaka. So I said, we'll do a normal three kilometers combat air patrol. So we spread out abreast because we didn't have any other warning system. We had to clear each other's tail. And we went one run right. on this. Then we did an invert turn, rolled out. And I saw that the bombs which were put in on the runway the previous day were not filled up. Oh. So obviously there were nothing that could get airborne. So I realized that the war, as far as a fighter pilot goes, air combat had seized off the very first day itself. So I said, okay, I told him, is Ajit Bhavnani. I said, Ajit, I'm going for a loop. So when we came over the Dhaka runway, I did a loop. And then suddenly I found, I said, and after that you do a loop, because I fell back, he went ahead. So I said, then you do a loop and we'll be abreast again. But then I saw the puff of smoke over his aircraft. I suddenly realized that the ACAC gun, Second World War vintage, heavy wala, a five inch, which was slow rate of fire, but big around exploding 16,000 feet. Oh, I said, <laughs> my God, what a silly thing to do. I said, abandon and hard right, hard left, we came abreast. This story I never told anyone till about six, seven years back when the previous chief of air staff was Sasso, senior staff officer. One day he asked me, okay, sir, where are you? I said, I'm in Delhi. Mm -hmm. He said, can you come? We have to discuss something. So I went there and he asked me, uh -oh. <laughs> he asked me, okay, sir, the bomb which you dropped on Dhaka runway, what was the damage it caused? I said, uh, when we went on a day after the war was, uh, ceasefire was declared, we saw the crate which were nearly 25 feet deep and about uh, 25, 30 feet uh, in diameter, 500 kg, 45 degrees angle, really penetrated uh, and exploded. LCN of the runways were also not uh, so hard those days. Then I said, Manika, now that you're talking of Dhaka, let me tell you a story that we dropped the bomb. They were so effective that they couldn't fill them up. Engineers were not able to uh, fill them up. They couldn't cope up with the, uh, uh, the size of crater which we had created. And that's why I said I did a, a loop. So he said, oh, sir, it was you. I was wondering who could be like that. <laughs> Immediately called somebody from his staff and he brought a printout. He said, sir, three days back we got this printout. One, the Pakistani pilot, Air Force pilot who was there in Dhaka, he saw that and he wrote in his book in two years later or something, that we were sitting there and we saw this aircraft come and do a loop. I went totally crazy and I went to the engineer, touched his feet and told him, please fill the craters up. We got to get airborne once. 
I realized, my God, and of course he used abusive language. I realized how effective the maneuver was. If you couldn't, <laughs> as far as the morale shattering goes of our enemy, in that, of course, those circumstances. That was very interesting. Of course, another two missions, which as a, a MiG-21 pilot, I really uh, feel very proud. I did a one versus one combat with MiG-29. Advantage MiG-21 has that it's a reasonably good aircraft in maneuvers. It has all the thing, except that MiG-29 is far superior if it comes to sustain effort. No, but the person who sits in a cockpit of aircraft, which is so superior, is also overconfidence. And to my mind, that becomes a little damaging in terms of performance thereafter. If the guy handles the, uh, like 21 is handled well, then you'll certainly find that you'll get, you are in for a surprise. So I knew exactly what it was. And all these aircraft which are uh, flying today are very wide belly aircraft. Uh -huh. uh, their blind below them is far, very high. Yes. So I had decided, so when we said, when we uh, used to do air combat, we used to uh, come, I mean, neutral advantage. So we used to come abreast of each other, 2.5 kilometers apart. And then call was given, combat, combat, go. And you turned in. Mm. So when he turned into me, I just accelerated a little more because we were flying at 850. So I said, let me touch 1000. And after touching 1000, now I could pull much higher G initially. And now he had come inside me when I did this. Now thereafter, he had no option but to reverse. When he reversed, in my reversal, I went down and came below his belly. Now he couldn't see me where I was. <laughs> when you don't see other aircraft, above your radar is telling you, your other systems are saying, but below the belly, nothing is telling you where he is. So with the result, he was only putting on bank, right, left. So he was moving forward. Then I just did one chota barrel and came behind. So I thought that was, of course, you can do it only <laughs> once. Uh, next time he'll get you the first go itself. That's right. But the fact is that I, uh, my belief is that you will go into fight with a, one enemy. If you do it well, he'll not go back to tell the story to other people. <laughs> 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 then another one which I liked and I remember is the two Mirage 2000 versus one old 77, which used to really maneuver very well. Once again, they were very, very overconfident. They had the close combat missile, which could fire at a various high angles. But I asked them only one question in the briefing. I said, what is your near boundary? So they said 530 meters, sir. So to me, like if you'll recollect, any boxer, when he gets tired, he gets into the other guy's body. Mm. So we call it in Hindi, we call it bugly, that you get into the armpit of the other person and the other fighter. So he can't do anything. Even if he's knocking you, he can't, there's no force in the punches. So I did the same thing. When we came into combat, I did one turn and the second one, I dropped my speed to get in within that distance of 500 meters. Now they couldn't fire at me. So they, they're saying lock on, but I said, if the missile goes, then tell me. Of course, then by, because they got very excited, they didn't expect this. So I had both of them turning from one side to other side in my front camera. I always remember that the confidence which, uh, turns into overconfidence because the machine you are sitting in and you think the other aircraft is so inferior, not really knowing that it's not so bad. One has to cater for the man also sitting behind. That's right. And that's why I, I always say, when you did any air combat with anyone, I mean, I remember also that attempting a getaway immediately after first turn on half maneuvering, because you realize the person sitting, he is neither falling for your maneuvering he is independent thinking. Mm -hmm. So he knows exactly. So he is a skillful person who knows his machine and he also knows your mind that what you're trying to do. So it's best to get away because he's a better machine. So you just wait for a chance and just get out. <laughs> we say the same thing, east or west, it doesn't matter if it's air combat, the pilot in the aircraft makes all the difference. You can have the best aircraft or the worst aircraft. And if you match that with the worst or the best pilot, it really can change the day. Yeah, that's true, that's so. true. Great. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Saran. What I'd like to do is I'd like to wrap up with our normal, usual questions. And then if you still have some time, I have some listener questions I'd like to pose to you. But let's start with what are you doing now and, and what does the future hold? I, I assume, are you retired or are you doing some other work on the side or maybe still advising the Air Force? No, nothing to do with aviation per se. I have uh, 
I retired in 1996. So I've been in retirement for 24 years. It's a long time. Congratulations. But uh, huh. after that, of course, I joined the Reliance Petroleum Corporation Limited, which is as a head of the aviation uh, thing for five years. Thereafter, I did uh, many other things. I dehydrated food. I was a director and a part owner. Then I set up a factory to manufacture bathroom fixtures. Presently, what I'm actually involved then, of course, I produce salt pans where I produce salt, normal. Okay. That's not really my major thing. Major thing now, I'm a founder director in one of the software company. I keep going to Delhi for 10, 15 days in a month and keep myself occupied. Mm. Uh, Vincent, I'll be turning 78 this year, so I don't think that I really have to <laughs> go much for. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still sound and, and seem young to me. You've got a great spirit, and I always tell people who uh, enjoy what we do that it's never you never change. We're like grown-up kids, you and I. Absolutely, <laughs> and that's the great advantage <laughs> that keeps us going. We always, uh, yeah. they, we always that's right. so uh, child uh, in our spirit and our approach and attitude yes. that nothing ever bothers us, frankly, you know. There you go. Well, I try not to. That's not always true, but I certainly <laughs> try. All right. The other thing, as I recall from the air marshal, was that uh, your call sign sometimes changes whether you're in a different squadron or a different position. So I think he was for a time Cope and then Fulcrum 1. And so I have to think you've had more than one call sign over the years, Saran. Oh, yes. I have many, but the main which one I like more. I mean, like I would say one squadron, three squadron, which had the emblem was a cobra. Okay. So the CEO was cobra leader and others had the snake. So I was a rattler there because I like the sound of rattler. Ah. Then there's one scorn where we had the guns, the uh, 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 armament. So I was rattler there, rattler gun. So, you know, I mean, a uh, gatling gun. So it was <laughs> rattler, gatling. Of course, what Kalsan I like because one of uh, person who I treat as the person who really taught me was black leader. So he died, of course, unfortunately, in one of the air crashes. So I used black uh, call sign. He used to use black earlier. I used black for many other things, except the two fighters squadron which I commanded. I was rapier one in one of them. Okay. And uh, Thunderbird uh, in the other one. And my main uh, pet name, of course, in the Air Force, the old timers still call me as Bundle. And the later people, last 25 years types, they call me as uh, Surin. So... Well, bundle, does that have a meaning that uh, the listeners might find yes. interesting? Oh, oh, yes. It's a very funny story. Bundle, we had one Tyagi in the Indian Air Force senior to us. He was instructor in our time. He was bundle because he was really tell all kind of stories and have everyone in split of laughter, like bundle of joy or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, so every Tyagi then came person who became chief of air staff, Sashi Tyagi, SP Tyagi. We, he and I contemporary. So he came a uh, few months before me, so he was bundle. I got commission, I was also bundle. I mean, as a cadet only, they used to call us bundle, both of us. Of course, he was in different squadron. Then we landed up in when we came to MFs, both of us came in the same squadron. Now, what happened there, he was a little senior to me, and he got married very early. And I was still at the stage where... Uh, girlfriend's era, Matla, you still were, you know, had girlfriends and talking and all that. Now, all the bills from the various messages and everything, when they came as bundle, his bill used to come to me. <laughs> and all my <laughs> calls from girlfriends used to land up with him and he used to be talking to them. So I said, one minute, <laughs> uh -oh. I said, this got to stop. I said, let's change our name now. I became uh, uh, Surin. And he became Sashinda. From Sashinda, he became Sashi. Okay. And from Surinda, I became Suren. So both our pet names changed thereafter. So anyone who calls us bundle now is the person who was senior to us in younger days. Anybody who flew with us when we were, became little senior, that was the time that our name changed. They call General Suren, sir. You know, I mean, it's like that. And to him, Sashi, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> It never fails. Call signs always have a great story. Oh, yes. And they're usually something funny or something you've done. So that's really great, uh, Saran. I appreciate that. And thanks for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. And if you're willing, we'll just keep going here for a few minutes with some listener questions. Yes, yes, please. 
Okay, so let's call these a lightning round, as we would call them. So we'll kind of get through them relatively quickly. Right. And these are from our Patreon supporters. And these are listeners who choose on the internet to come to a certain site where they actually help support the show financially. And we're so happy for that. Uh, So one of the questions is from Jordan Miller, who says he understands that initial versions of the MiG-21 had a radar cooled with alcohol and that it would evaporate as it was used. So it wasn't useful for very long. He's wondering if there's any truth to that. And did you fly with any aircraft that used alcohol to cool the radars? Yes. This was uh, Alma's uh, radar, which came in MiG-21 biz. Okay. They had alcohol. And mostly Russians, when it used to get very cold, generally used that for other purpose also. <laughs> you didn't mind having a swig, I suppose. <laughs> so alcohol came in for uh, cooling of radar. Yes, that's right. Okay. Did you know how much you had or did it just work until it ran out? No, we had no indication. Oh, okay. So it just worked and then it stopped working. But generally yeah. in India, we didn't knew uh, it, it was not required very much unless you were flying high altitude missions. Because most time the temperatures were very reasonable. So the radar were reasonably cooled otherwise. Okay. I want to ask you something that came up with, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, our other episode from Exploitation, where the American pilots are used to American type of aircraft, and he found it very difficult to taxi with the brake system, and also he found the attitude indicator to be very challenging. Now, you've flown different aircraft since. How did you find the taxiing in the MiG-21, but also the attitude indicator if you switched from different systems, perhaps? Actually, Hunter was much, much lighter aircraft, much simpler, also easier to taxi because you could see so much more. It has a nice dripping canopy and the nose was tilting down. Whereas uh, MiG-21, there was no problem at all because taxiing, you were looking, taxiing on ground. Okay. So you had a plane runway, so a plane taxi track. So there is not a major problem, but there was a blind zone which was there which a little uh, more. Otherwise, taxing was, uh, it was simple. Okay. And not really. Except that it's like some of the cars which have a side uh, pillar, little thicker, you, when you're in it, you find little blind, little extra blind. That's about all. <laughs> okay. How about the attitude indicator? Because I think it's different from what we use in the West. And I didn't know if later on you flew, you said Jaguar and Mirage. That's right. Was, did you have to change your mind to back and forth? So there was simple here, you had to see inside them. Okay. Particularly when you're doing uh, training instrument flying or when you're flying in clouds, you had to be totally on instruments. But then uh, it was right to eye level, so really not a serious problem. I found that they were very manageable, very helpful. Huh? Okay. Listener James Kirikoffi says, what were some of the vulnerabilities of the blind spots when you were doing BFM? And so we've already talked about below you, but was it difficult if someone was immediately behind you? Was it difficult to see that aircraft? Of course, it's true in any aircraft, but was that a limitation for the MiG-21, for the blind spots? Well, in dogfighting, one is the when you were sitting, the dorsal fin was a little thicker. So your uh, rear vision was uh, constrained, but we had the rear view mirror, which helped and filled up that later versions. So that was uh, really not uh, not a serious problem. But only thing, as I said, long nose for looking down, there was in the front aspect, you had a little problem of uh, blind spots were a little more. I would argue any aircraft that is directly behind you is difficult to see no matter which aircraft because you have to twist yourself right. so far around. I wonder, by the way, how, how is your neck and back, if you don't mind me asking, after so many years and so many thousands of hours? Well, I must say that I still don't use glasses to read. Wow. And uh, when I crash landed, that time the G meter broke at 16 G and I had two compressions. Oh, gosh. And my spine, of course, little burn, a fair amount of burn, 40 degrees burn, shoulder and all kind of damages. And thereafter, recently, I have uh, written off four cars, my driver, of course, and somebody else hitting us. <laughs> With the result, there are a lot more in body. There are large number of damage. I have four compression fractures, etc., etc. Oh, gosh. More from driving than from flying, though. That's right. But my right shoulder is broken, left Achilles tendon is broken. Uh, left elbow is damaged, but I am absolutely fit. And when you meet me and when you'll shake my hand, you will never know when I approach you that I have had even a single uh, mishap. Like probably you can't make out that I have two cheek, both my cheekbones are cracked, but you can't really uh, see that they were cracked. Wow. So I suppose uh, 
this is one of those things that to my mind I feel that since you are flying under high G for a very long period, mm-hmm. your body actually builds up better than when you have break and fly only once in a while. Most people when they retire they get into no flying zone in the organization for some years and that's why right. in my case I flew my last sortie only three days before and this was a air combat. Because I said last time I can fly with one youngster, so I took him in trainer. Okay. So, I mean, I, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up is Rick Harris, who says he would like to know if he has flown any Western tactical aircraft. And you said that you flew the Mirage 2000 and the Jaguar and the MiG-29, which isn't Western. But what was a comparison to the two or, or three or four? But again, I think we've talked about the MiG-21 being able to be upgraded to very similar to those, even though it's an older aircraft. But right. which aircraft would you say maybe, or let's just pick the Mirage 2000. How would you compare the Mirage and the MiG-21? No, Mirage 2000 is certainly a far superior aircraft in terms of uh, multi road capability, armament carriage, aids available to you. So it's certainly, if I have the money, I would go for Mirage 2000. Mm. If I don't have money, then I'll go for MiG-21. <laughs> okay. Still very capable. All right. Patrick Peterson, he would like to know, why did the Indian Air Force choose the MiG-21 instead of an upgraded MiG-19, like the MiG-19S, and what are the advantage of the MiG-21 platform compared to the MiG-19? And I think speed is probably one of them, huh? Speed is one of them. Because at that point in time, when we got them in uh, 1963, uh, 19s were actually uh, really going out, kind of. They were not the front line, and that time we wanted front line Russian aircraft. So that's how one went for uh, MiG 21. Right. And good thing that we went for MiG 21. <laughs> ah, yes, indeed. Okay. Benjamin Todd, who's a friend of mine from Colorado, he says he likes to hear about other weapon schools. And you had said, Siren, that you were in the fighter combat school. So was that an Indian school? And, and what was that like? And again, just relatively quickly. We, it's an Indian school. Okay. We call it Tagdi. Tagdi, which is now moved out from Jamnagar. Earlier, it was in Jamnagar, uh, where I commanded also. When I was uh, base commander here, then the school was here. Okay. Uh, it is uh, like, uh, I mean, any other fighter combat school anywhere in the... Okay. So like a Top Gun where you do um, right. dog fighting and academics. That's right. And classrooms and... Okay. How long is it? Uh, now it's about nearly nine months. Oh, wow. Okay. So more like the Air Force's fighter weapon school than Top Gun. That's right. Not only the air combat, it also air to ground. Okay. I mean, it's a total combat, a total uh, capability of a fighter in fighter squadron. Okay. So like in Top Gun for the Navy and the Marine Corps, you become very good. I don't know how else to put this, but almost like at an individual level or maybe in two ship or four ship. But at the Air Force Fighter Weapon School, as I understand it, you become more strategic where you are involved with B1s and B2s. Uh, Which one is yours more like? In between two of them. Okay. I mean, you are there basically for training the younger people, all the tricks and trade and uh, theoretical and practical aspect of air combating, air to ground firing, how to improve your scores, how to do, and tactical formation flying. And also you are the advisor for any uh, strategic move in terms of tactical level of uh, fighter squadrons. Okay. Utilization. So you suppose I have to plan a strike somewhere in enemy area, then you would be sitting there and uh, giving the opinion and more advising that how to build the formations, what kind of compositions, what kind of attack directions, how many formations to come from where. So it is also that uh, on that aspect, yes. Great. All right, Tom Little, who says, uh, whose tactics are they using? I assume they don't use old Soviet tactics. Are you using US-type tactics? Uh, What countries have influenced your tactics, or maybe your own? Well, actually, we use our own tactics, because uh, let me say we started with little uh, immature kind of thing that we, all the fighter pilots, when we all came in, had only the Second World War to fall in. Mm. So we were seeing the movies of Second World War and we were seeing, reading the books of Second World War and the exploit of the fighter pilot uh, or the pilots of Second World War. So everything was basically turning combat, getting behind other chap and opening your guns and shooting. Anyone who got behind got better. Right. So that's how we started. And Hunt over the aircraft, which also went into same. Everything was stick in stomach, turn in reverse, and if you can get the other guy, uh, get it, turn, in, turn inside him and you can lay your sight, you probably get him. But then we started uh, changing ourselves. The tactics school, when it came in, it formulated all the tactics by ourselves. 
because we actually formulated and it came on MiG 21s. So, basic uh, tactics formulation started with the MiG 21 performance mm. and then Su 7 joined in, which was a little better in terms of strikes. And thereafter, of course, now it has all the modern aircraft there. So. Right. Kevin Drummond would like to ask what aircraft do you think, fighter aircraft specifically, the Indian Air Force should procure next and why? So we already have the Su-30 MKI, very capable, but are the Indian Air Force folks looking for something new or no. what would you recommend? I mean, just to share with you, I was a member of the committee which formulated a, a vision plan for Air Defense for India 2020. That was 25-year plan in 1994-95. It got approved and what we are procuring today is pending from that time. So I am, <laughs> 2020 has already come. We're just about getting our Rafale, mm. which was... I mean, any aircraft, Rafale or anything which had to come, was supposed to be coming by 2002 or 2003. But there are other constraints politically, so these are different things. Of course. So the fact is, because MiG-21, as I said, was the major fleet composition of Indian Air Force. No, they all are being phased out, have been phased out. 23s have been phased out. MiG-27s have been phased out. 29s are in upgradation mode now. They would probably stay for longer. Jaguars have been there from 1980, so they've been 82. So they've been also for there for a long, long time. Uh, they have been upgraded. So with the result, we need new aircraft. Now Mirage 2000 squadron, which we have also been upgraded, probably will upgrade them further. So we needed some induction of new aircraft to at least uh, ensure the air defense and security of national borders and airspace. And now particularly when the naval aspects are becoming uh, more uh, active, particularly our neighbor in the East mm -hmm. now getting active. So, I mean, even if U.S. comes, probably they'll need somebody else from local to lend them helping hand. <laughs> so I suppose um, that's the reason that we have to do That's why we Rafales are coming and hopefully we'll get the number we had initially planned, 120 or so. Okay. Or uh, Tejas, which is uh, also reasonably uh, advanced aircraft, of course, they're upgrading it already, the Indian built, which will, if it comes in full force, would take care of, uh, Firmware is going to take time. It'll take five, seven years. Okay. So we need immediately, All right. but we need to fill this void, which has already been created by phasing out of uh, old aircraft. Older, yes. Okay. And on that note, Eamon McHugh says, how do you keep the MiG-21 relevant against the Generation 4, 4.5 four or 5 fighters? And I think we've talked already about some of the upgrades that are happening. That's right. It's mainly because the upgrade which has happened is really, to my mind, it's a very decent upgrade on the platform, which was really so old that you couldn't really spend much more and find that you had to shelve it after a little while. Mm -hmm. Of course, these aircraft have already done 20 years after upgradation, so which is a fair amount of time. And uh, probably last for another year, a few years, till the time we get some other aircraft come in. So it's basically that it may not be in terms of uh, other performances, uh, like the modern, most modern, more hard, uh, later generation, fifth generation and fourth generation aircraft. But with the upgradation, I would feel that it is uh, reasonably compatible it won't le be left far behind even if there is one-to-one -one engagement. Okay. But now what has happened, the ground support and the air environment to support you in terms of other uh, help, in terms of picking up targets, informing you of the threat, is also improved in our country. Bison gets the inputs which you need to uh, get something uh, neutralized from the other side of a better aircraft. Gotcha. Okay. Just a couple more questions quickly. One, John Clark says there's an anecdote about Soviet era aircraft that were designed for wartime operational tempos. So they would have components with short lifespans, but they could be quickly changed in the field. And so John asks, what was done to improve reliability of the MiG-21 and its components in order to provide a longer service life for the Indian Air Force? Actually, they, we really went with them uh, mainly because they were upgrading their aircraft and we were buying those aircraft from them under license condition to produce here. So that was the reason that we went up, uh, stayed with them for a long time. And you were able to upgrade some of the systems yourself, like the fuel, right? We didn't really talk about it, but there was That's right. ability for the fuel to get trapped and reduce the, um, what am I trying to say, move the center of gravity aft, etc. That's right. Also the instrumentation, a lot of instrumentation we were uh, producing in our own country and did a lot of uh, upgradation 
minor though, but it did ourselves here. Mm. All right. And then the final question from Dan Ross, we've touched on this already, is uh, what were the fish bed's unique strengths in BFM and how would you try to maximize them? And I think you said one of them was you could really get slower than the other pilot might think, huh? That's right. You could, I mean, the flying envelope was very large and it stayed maneuvering as long as you didn't put too much of pressure on the aircraft in terms of stick movement and you control the angle of attack. It had a very high angle of attack for optimal lift was 28 degrees. So, which really gave you a fair amount of, uh, as long as you maintain it uh, initial, after initiating, you could get it down to 2018. You could really maneuver that aircraft very, very well. Wow. Which is about, as you said earlier, the F-16 designed to counter the MiG-21. That's about the limitation on it is, I think, 24, 26 degrees, something like that. That's right. Wow. So... 28 is the optimal lift, and it, of course, stalls at uh, 34, so which is very high angle of attack. Yes. Well, Saran, this has been a lot of fun. I can tell you have a deep enthusiasm for flying and for the MiG-21, and I'm just so grateful that you took the time to share it with us today. No, I'm really thankful because, as I would uh, actually very frankly admit to you, any fighter pilot, if asked to talk and discuss his Beloved aircraft, I think he would just go into <laughs> ecstasy, you know. <laughs> so, and these days, since I don't discuss, I'm not into aviation uh, things, so I really don't discuss these things very much with anyone. Well, Many things probably I have talked after maybe 20 years or more sometimes. <laughs> well, I'm glad to uh, let you do that once again, and it, it's just been a lot of fun. Thank you. And great fun talking to you, Vincent. And uh, okay. uh, before we part, I would just... Now, we, of course, uh, we have the, each other's IDs and we can always get in touch. But uh, India is a beautiful country and uh, Indians are very beautiful people. So if you ever decide, I can only say that I'll host a trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'd like, like to take you up on that, Saran. Okay. Thank you very much, Vincent. And it's great, great talking to you. It's always great fun talking of old days and of the fighter aircraft particularly MiG-21 for me. Thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I mean, wow. Nearly 5,000 total flight hours, 4,000 of which in the MiG-21 during 34 years of service, flying numerous different aircraft, flying loops over a bombed opponent's airfield. Surin is quite the character, Harish. Was he, was he always this cheerful yeah. back in the good old days? Yeah, wow, really. I mean, he, he said it so well. But it was... Uh... Fun and a great storyteller, uh, mostly funny ones, and some of them not necessarily factual, <laughs> which 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 one identified from his laugh, you know? Oh boy! And that's how you know the way he laughed, you knew what he was saying. Oh yeah! And that's how he carried uh, forward the nickname that he got uh, of all Tyagis in the Indian Air Force. Bangal actually in, in Hindi means to spin a yarn, you know, mm. <laughs> so a packet of yarn or something, a bundle yeah, like yeah. that. Well, I came out of the MiG-21s in 75 in the same squadron, like I said earlier. And he was a senior, experienced pilot and a leader. He was amazing, actually, full of beans, you know, always bubbly. Here. So, <laughs> so, so typically his interview, you know, frankly. Uh, he was a lot of fun. We'll have to bring him back if we can. And uh, that was just so much fun. I just want to ask you about a couple things. Uh, the connection when I recorded with him was not fantastic. It was tough sometimes to understand. And I want to make sure I did hear correctly. Did he say that some of the early MiG-21s just had very few flight instruments in the cockpit available for the pilot? <laughs> Sorry, in a bundle, as he said, uh, he said that. I think I heard that in the interview. Flew by the seat of his pants. Ah. He probably didn't need any instruments or never bothered to look at them. <laughs> so it didn't matter if they were there or not, huh? I think what he meant, actually, in my opinion, was uh, that the early versions had very few instruments and not, nothing sophisticated. Mm. But they did have all the basic flying instruments, engine and systems, and you know, indicators. But okay. but uh, you didn't look at them, maybe. You know, just flew by the attitude and, and see that the pens. Well, I'm sure all the listeners figured it out. I just, for whatever reason, stumble on that. Yeah. And then my question to him about the most Gs he'd ever pulled was poorly worded. Was the MiG-21 9G capable? Or maybe he was talking about pulling 9Gs in the Fulcrum? Well, um, well no, no. Actually, the MiG-21 aircraft limit was 7.5G. Okay. If I remember correctly. Different variants had 75 8 but like all Russian aircraft, it was built very strongly and one, mm. I mean, could put more in the heat of the moment and in the battle and get away with it without any noticeable damage. 
Of course, the aircraft couldn't sustain a 9G turn with the available thrust forever, mm-hmm. unlike the Fulcrum. But I've known of cases, you know, people who were 9, 10. I knew one Su-7 pilot, actually, that was so strong. He hauled 12 one day oh, and came by mistake, of course, and came with a bent pito head. He lost his pito head in front. It was just bent <laughs> forward like a limp, you know. You know. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Yeah, we had some similar stories in our F-15 episode. So as I often say on this show, I think fighter pilots are the same the world over. doesn't matter what you look like or with what accent you speak with. But oh, yeah. goodness. Now, I want to ask you this, because pilots here in the States... We generally fly the same aircraft throughout our career, and we might switch if uh, aircraft is retired, or once in a great while, like my friend, uh, he started off flying helicopters and ended up in jets. But you and Surin both reported flying several different aircraft over your careers, and is that common for Indian Air Force pilots to fly so many different aircraft? Uh, not really, Wilson. You know, in our time in the 60s, uh, that we're talking about, 50s and 60s and 70s, we had a lot of older aircraft, like the French Oregons, uh, Mystères, and also the English hunters Mm -hmm. that were being slowly, uh, apart from training younger pilots, before they moved on to the Su-7 or the MiG-21 that were coming in the late 60s, they were being phased out, so people had to change. Also, for a long time, our operational training units were equipped firstly with the Hunter and then the MiG-21, so everybody flew them in our time, you know, generations and Mm -hmm. later generations flew all all of them at some time on the MiG-21. And later, the same lot had to... Men, the newly acquired uh, Jaguars, the MiG-23, 27s, Mirage 2000s, MiG-29s, and the Su-30s that came over the years. I mean, a lot of variety of aircraft in our Air Force, so people had some early experience with some, and then moved on to the others. So we got to fly more than one time. Also, when you became, as you know, in your Air Force, you become a senior instructor, examiner, inspector. We had to convert on different types so that we could fly them. With the, with the operational squadrons, but nobody really served in the operational squadrons in those new aircraft uh, or did a lot of time on them. Mm-hmm. For example, I knocked at the Su-30 on the base commander in 1997, so I flew them, but not like a normal squadron pilot, and I had very few hours. I flew once in a while, of course. And uh, currently, though we have a multitude of combat aircraft uh, types also, the trend is largely to keep pilots and technicians of the same type for as long as possible, and move them to other types only for command purposes, if there's no vacancy in the same squadron, limited number of squadron, uh, familiarization, testing, or inspection purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's strengths and weaknesses to both approaches. Uh, On the one hand, to fly different models can teach you different things about flying in general. But on the other hand, you might confuse procedures or emergency responses to different aircraft. But I don't know. I only mostly flew the F-18 my career, and then I had a chance to fly the F-16 at the end. And I just remember it was refreshing at that point after over 3,000 hours in the Hornet to learn something new and to kind of change my muscle memory a little bit. So again, I, I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but I think there's some arguments to be made. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it also costs in maintenance and training, but, right. but you know, like, you know, as you become senior, like in a base that I was on, I had the MiG-21s and I had the 23 uh, and the 29. Mm. So I used to rotate and fly, but I tried to fly only one type that day. Okay. You understand? I didn't fly one to the other and the third triple and second one because you know force of habit you could make a mistake so it's better to just fly one type that day and the next type the next day well there was a time right before i retired that i was actually qualified in three different aircraft but two of them were f-18s the hornet and the super hornet and those were so similar it almost didn't matter and then also the f-16 so uh but i think there's also that's not something you'd want to do with a brand new pilot obviously by then i'd had quite a bit of experience over a number of years so again i think there's arguments to be made for either one now regarding the missile nomenclature i had to look this up afterwards but the r-73 is the nato aa 11 archer we would call it and then when bundle said the r77 and i later said the aa12 adder those are the same thing so that was just me not knowing the r77 and harish you mentioned right before we rolled tape for this that you were involved in the mig-21 bison upgrades in india what can you tell us about that whole experience well the r77 that he called uh, the aa12 adder is also known as the amramsky right the russian version of the amram if you remember i think we talked about that in the Falcon interview. That's right. And I was actually in charge of the base upgrade program for about three years from 
93 to 96. Mm -hmm. That required initially, you know, the whole system architecture definition and the contract formulation and negotiations and contract signing. So I was there till the end. And uh, our approach basically, I mean, Bundle briefly mentioned what it had. Uh, just to expand on it, our approach in the Bison was actually to make, to upgrade a large number of, of aircraft, Big 21, because we didn't have a replacement coming, economical. Because in the 90s, we didn't have the money to buy replacement aircraft. Okay. And, and, we, and we wanted quantity, lots of aircraft till the LCA came and whatever. So the whole Bison concept was based on a multi mode radar with supporting avionics and displays. Like uh, we had a ring laser gyro with an embedded gyro inertial lamp uh, with an embedded GPS, uh, hard head down displays, video recording systems, and an EW suite. And with both air to air and air to surface uh, precision weapons, you know, missiles we already talked about, but we also had uh, guided weapons for air to surface work. So we gave it a formidable multi role capability. And of course, uh, the limitations on the aerodynamics and the engine, which couldn't be changed right. in this money, limited money. And just by the way, it costs us about $4 million a piece, including the weapons on it, you know, on each. So not very much. We couldn't uh, improve the agility of the aircraft, but we could put in a large number of, uh, shall I say, MiG-21s against uh, a small number, number of more advanced adversaries. That was the idea. Yeah. Well, there's strength in numbers. Yeah, they say quantity has a quality of its own. There you go. And particularly if the aircraft itself has some basic uh, good features and, you know, strengths. Yeah. Quantity has a quality all its own. I like that. I'll have to put that next to my, I've got a list of sayings now that I've taken from folks from the show. So I'll have to add that one to it. All right. Well, hey, what else would you add to our discussion today on the MiG-21 in general, Harish? Well, <laughs> when Bundle talks, you know, and he's an expert, I really can't add much to what he said, <laughs> except, you know, that I enjoyed the interview. It was a great interview. Oh, he yeah. spoke so well. One doesn't see, you know, what I was impressed by was his enthusiasm. And he's close to 80. I think he's 78 now. And he sounded like a youngster to me. I don't know about you, but he sounded like <laughs> a young fighter about it to me. <laughs> Well, when we recorded, we were on Zoom, so I was able to watch him laughing, and it was a yeah. lot of fun. And he's right about the MiG-21 being so, shall I say, he loved it, because I also enjoyed flying the 21 for over a thousand hours. It never let me down, you know, equal number of takeoffs, as he said, and landings, yeah. all with wheels down, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> not even the wheels Well, down. you know, when you look back in the gosh it's only been a little over 100 years of flight and already how far we've come but when you think of quintessential fighters of the era of course you've got the Sopwith Camel and at least from my perspective in the west the P51 Mustang and and uh, the Messerschmitts and so many others from World War II but when you look from the mid 50s on I think you could make an argument that the MiG-21 is maybe the quintessential fighter you're, you're bad. I think it's one of the, I mean, you, you mentioned in the beginning, I think, somewhere, I think there were some 11,000 big 21s produced. Over I mean, India itself had a more, more than 1,000, you know, finally 600 locally manufactured. So our fleet was 60% mig 21s initially at one time. And it flew very well, let me tell you. I mean, it was, mm. it was a good buy, very economical, very cheap from the Soviet Union. And I think initially the government of India, because they didn't have the money at that time, paid Shoes and bananas, you know, leather and bananas exports in, in exchange or something like that. So really? pretty, pretty, pretty good deal, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I learned so much from that. And again, for the listeners, be sure to check out the bonus where Surin answers listener questions. You can find that on patreon.com. Search for the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And that helps support the show as well. As we begin to wrap up today, I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, which include Strike Leads Vincent Siorlis, Max Considine, Alex Kenzier, Evan Van Persum, Andrew Brunetto, and a new Airboss, Nicholas Grethen. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the U.S. Department of Defense, the Indian Ministry of Defense, or its components. Harish, it's been a pleasure sharing the airwaves with you once again, sir. Thanks for returning to the show to help us better understand the MiG-21. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, great for a fighter pilot to be on the show and share some thoughts. 
Hope we meet again soon. <laughs> well, we talked last time about meeting in person, and we've been thwarted in that effort so far, but maybe sometime we can do that. I look forward to that. Well, in the meantime, we'll keep in touch, and maybe we can bring you back to the show. So that'll do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Be well, and we'll see you all back next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening.